Last year, I quit my job, which was super exciting and also scary, and I never thought I would be that person, and yet here I am in my living room talking to myself. I have you to thank for it, so. Thanks for being here. When I first struck out on my own, I was super burned out and I just wanted some time to chill. So I started watching the Marvel Cinematic Universe in chronological order by story from the beginning, including the TV shows. <laughs> yeah, highly recommended. It was actually super fun and definitely a conversation starter. Link to the CNET list in the description. Thanks CNET. But this got me thinking about holograms, which are literally everywhere in Marvel's universe. All the Iron Mans, Black Panther, the Guardianses of the Galaxy, the Agences of S.H.I.E.L.D., because, you know, like Attorneys General. Yeah, makes sense. All the Avengers, oh, they love their holograms. Anyway, you get it. These movies are all set in the near future, but we don't actually have holograms yet, right? Do we? I have questions. Greetings programs, thanks for tuning in to Una Dose of Trace. Come find me on all the social medias and make sure you subscribe so you get all the episodes of Una Dose of Trace. We come out every single week. Welcome new people. I'm Trace, this is my channel. Computerized holograms are amazing and fascinating to humankind it would seem because the first attempt to make a three-dimensional hologram was in the 1960s. But holograms technically aren't what you're seeing in the MCU. Scientifically speaking, a hologram is a 2D thing that appears 3D. It's got more information in a 2D space than it should. A 3D thing that is a 3D thing would be called a volumetric image or volumetric display. Now I'm going to be using the term hologram but know that what I mean is a volumetric display. It's not entirely accurate to say hologram, but there's not really a quick way to say volumetric display and the acronym <clears throat> is taken. Yeah. So for my purposes today, a hologram is a three-dimensional image reproduced from a pattern of interference produced by a split coherent beam of radiation, such as a laser. Don't think radiation from nuclear plants, by the way, it's just light electromagnetic radiation. It's bathing on you right now out of my face. It's a 3D image that somehow is able to float in the air. It was first used as a pop culture plot device in the 1893 book, The Carpathian Castle by Bay Jules Verne. And that's just amazing. That man is amazing. I love it. Also read it. But really, Star Wars is sort of what made it a thing. Because if you look it up in pop culture, mentions of holograms, before the 70s, not that much going on. After the 70s, everywhere. And Star Wars loved volumetric displays, so much that they actually pegged the entire plot of Act One on the performance of a tiny little blue volumetric display. Help me, Obi-Wan Kenobi. You're my only hope. Holograms are painting with light in 3D space, but even though it's a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away, we are not quite like that yet here. Light doesn't just stop on its own. And that's the biggest obstacle to holograms. See, light just kind of tends to go in a direction until something stops it. For example, your eyeballs, when you look at the stars, the light that you're seeing is literally physically from that star, maybe it's a billion years old. That's amazing, right? But because that light doesn't stop until it gets absorbed into your eye buckets or hits the tree or the ground or an asteroid or whatever, most of our holograms have to cheat and look like this. These are spinning blades that simulate a 3D object. The LEDs are flashing really fast to emit light and make it seem like there's something there. Not unlike those stupid clocks that you used to get at Spencer's Gifts that just did this the whole day. Oh God, they were so dumb. Why did people buy those? The effect is pretending to be a hologram. And what it's relying on is the stupidity of our brains. I'll get back to that in a second. Because the screen is moving at such a high speed, you can't touch it. It would hit your finger. And I learned that the hard way as a kid. Curiosity almost took off my fingers, which is a story for another time. But if you wanna make a volumetric display without spinning blades or flitting back and forth like the stupid Spencer's gift clock, you need something to reflect light off of. One thing you see a lot is water like Disney's water projection for Fantasmic, which I love so much. Disney's use of science to make magic is the best. I love it so much. If you're watching and you work at Disney, call me because I would love to work there. Or other solids like UCLA's augmented reality sandbox, which you might have seen an example of in the recent episode of Smarter Every Day. But none of these are true holograms like you would see in Star Wars or Star Trek or the MCU, right? Somewhat disappointing. And yet, there are holograms out there in real life, and I looked up all of the information, let's do it. There are two types, plasma 
and particle holograms. Basically, our brain is lazy, so all you have to do is pulse a light in a circle or move a laser around, and our brain will draw the lines using those pulses to fill in the gaps, to make it seem like this is a butterfly. It's called the persistence of vision, and it's the same thing that makes movies and TV work. But movies and TV are two-dimensional, so their little light-emitting things are called pixels. But we're talking 3D, so we need a new word. Voxels. Yeah! It's literally the exact same thing, but it's just points in 3D space. So holograms today use the laziness of our brain plus voxels to make drawings in 3D space. Particle holograms are fascinating. They use lasers to literally trap particles in midair. Technically, they're called optical trap displays or free space volumetric displays. The most well-known one is out of Brigham Young University, and it's what you're seeing here. It's basically a tiny particle being suspended on the forces of near invisible laser light. The laser heats the particle a bit, allowing it to pull and push it around using the electro magnetic energy of the laser light. A second laser is actually creating the color and lighting it up, and they can make it any color you want. And if you walk around the display, it's actually there. It's in 3D space with you, which is incredible. If there were lots of particles there, like shooting around, creating a whole bunch of different things, you could walk around them and see the sides of, say, a person's face or the top of their head. It's there. It's physical. It's in front of you. But it's not perfect. Because right now, it's super teeny. And help me, Obi-Wan Kenobi. You're my only hope is just not as good as the one that they have. And they can't control lots of particles at once yet. They just got the one. By the way, that particle, not dust or plastic, it's cellulose. It's a plant fiber specifically made and picked up by the lasers. And that actually exposes another weakness because the particle, it can blow away in the wind and it's gone. Image would disappear. And that makes it tough for adoption in the military. On top of that, if this product is the one that comes to say CES in 2025 is like a thing that shoots out of your watch and tells you messages or like, uh, I don't know, is on the Google Home or something, you would probably then need particle cartridges. So you would sell the device and you still have a steady stream of income just like an inkjet printer. After a bit of time, your TV would be like, more particles is needed in order to watch the big game. So you gotta go fill up the old cellulose cartridge over at Best Buy or whatever. Ugh. Yay, capitalism. And so if you don't want a particle cartridge, you'd have to use the other system and that is a plasma hologram. Plasma solved that problem by just literally heating up the air. Here's a project called Fairy Lights and Femtoseconds. It's a display from Tokyo using high powered lasers fired for just a few femtoseconds at a time, creating a tiny ball of superheated plasma that's so metal in the air. It's ionizing actual air. No cellulose needed, which sounds a little bit like a Spider-Man villain, but in fact it's not, and you can touch it. Allegedly, it feels like sandpaper or like a little static shock. Even though it's a high powered laser, it doesn't burn you because the lasers fire for only like 30 to 270 femtoseconds, which is like quadrillionths of a second. They're also firing so fast that they can react to people as well. So you could have an interactive display where you can feel a checkbox and tap it or check it and it will be able to react to that. Or if you think about it, Tony Stark's virtual volumetric display suit <laughs> or whatever. But because it's a flash of plasma, I'm such an idiot. But because it's a flash of plasma, the color fidelity is limited. It can really just do white. <laughs> Unlike the optical trap display that has a whole gamut of colors. So both of these things look like holograms. They quack like holograms, so they're holograms or volumetric displays, right? Yes and no. They're not ready for consumer use yet, they're super tiny, and they're not entirely perfected and miniaturized yet. Plus, both plasma and particle displays have a big problem, and that's being see-through. Just like Princess Leia's message, you can see through the image no matter where you put it in 3D space. And solutions are thin on the ground as much as the images appear thin in the air. And while it works really well in movies, that would not make it easy to use as an actual computer display. So volumetric displays are real, but we can't use them quite like the Guardians' of the galaxy yet. No smooth, perfect surfaces, and depending on the tech, the color is a bit difficult. They're just pinpoints of light that our brain fills in the space around. But technically, the first TVs were low resolution black and white, and we commonly see 4K TVs today with flat surfaces of 8 million pinpoints of light and a huge color gamut. And once we figure out the technology, what's to stop voxels from being able to get denser and brighter and better in every way? The main thing there is data. A tiny icon on your computer screen might be 256 rows of 256 pixels, right? But a voxel adds another dimension, 256 by 256 by 256, which is a huge increase in data. And I'm no computer engineer, but we're talking like an order of magnitude at least. Imagine if your 4K TV needed to make 4,000 depths as well, every 24th of a second or every 60th or 120th of your gaming. The data throughput for something like that would be 
nutso. I read one writer who did some math and they said that it might be hundreds of gigabytes per second for a very small, like one 720p volumetric display. Because of all these problems, for now, we just have to cheat. We use 2D displays to mimic three dimensions. We call it virtual reality, which is all encompassing, or augmented reality, which is an overlay. I love augmented reality. I think it's gonna be way huger than VR very soon because AR kit comes in every single one of these. Imagine creating virtual dimensional displays over information and advertisements, games and scavenger hunts, updates on specific locations or at restaurants, geocaches. The possibilities of the amount of data that you could layer onto the boring old reality we already live in would be amazing, and you don't have to write a whole new reality. There's already a lot of data out here ready for us. And if Pokemon Go can get people out of the house with a tiny little teeny screen, if we give people glasses, then there's no tiny window into a virtual world. It is the world. And mark my words, as Queen Oprah said, a billion pockets, y'all. Also, you know, 50 million wrists. So maybe soon a million faces. You know, Apple will create a device that works with the AR kit to take it from here to here. Then we can fake it until we literally can make it. Making this show, I spend a lot of time driving up and down the coast of California because one, it's beautiful, and because two, both San Francisco and Los Angeles have some amazing science that I want to explore. But I also want to enrich my brain while I'm driving, which is why I love audiobooks. There's never been a better time to start listening on Audible. Audible has the largest selection of audiobooks on the planet. And because you watch Uno Dose of Trace, you get a 30-day free trial that also supports the show when you go to audible.com slash trace or text trace to 500-500. A whole month for free. This year I've decided to only read books by women, and most recently I listened to Buried Beneath the Baobab Tree by Adobe Trisha Nubani. And this was a powerful book about girls kidnapped by Boko Haram in Nigeria. It's got unusual and gripping writing, a gut-wrenching story, and wow, what an ending. Anyway, check it out. There's never been a better time to start listening on Audible. Now with Audible Originals, the selection has gotten even more custom with content made for members. Audible, the most inspiring minds, the most compelling stories, the best place to listen. Again, go to audible.com slash trace, T-R-A-C-E, or text trace to 500-500. Listen for a change. And remember, it supports the show, which is good for you and good for me. So thanks. Now obviously VR is having and has had a big moment right now, and I didn't mention it because I thought you might want to check out Milan's video, The Scienceverse. He gathered a bunch of different ways that VR is being used to help us cope with the human condition while we wait for volumetric technology to catch up. What if I told you that we could integrate ourselves into our own imagination with VR and even improve both our physiological and psychological well-being by doing so? That's because we are. VR's ability to be a game changer in neuromedicine is amazing. So amazing I've decided to dedicate an entire video on my channel to explaining how. So be sure to hop onto the science first in this two-part collab. And of course, do be sure to subscribe to my friend Trace Dominguez because, well, his channel's pretty dope too. Everyone, thank you so much for tuning in to Uno Dose of Trace. I am about to head out on a huge trip to film some Hello Science episodes. So make sure you come follow me over on Instagram so you can see all the adventures and maybe guess what episodes are coming because they're so exciting. Okay, so with that, thanks again for watching. Please come join the Patreon, help support the show. You can help support me out on these adventures and I will see you in the future.